It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 307 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 12th of August, 2018. I'm Ed Brown, and on the show today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And two small announcements before we get started. Scienceontop.com slash donate is where to go if you want to become a Patreon and support the show. You get to pick how much you donate per episode, and you get different rewards accordingly. A big thanks to all our generous Patreon supporters. And the other announcement is that Dr. Pamela Gay will be giving a talk, a question and answer session uh, in Melbourne, Australia on October the 10th, and we will be doing a live Science on Top recording with her. For those who don't know, Pamela Gay is an astronomer, a podcaster, a citizen science advocate, and an amazing science communicator. Uh, Lucas and I interviewed her back in 2013. Uh, We'll have a link to that in the show notes. Uh, And also she gave a talk uh, at Swinburne University that same year about big data in astronomy. So we'll have a link to that as well. The tickets uh, to the show on Wednesday, the 10th of October, they cost $20 Australian, but all proceeds go to the non-profit Astronomical Society of the Pacific where Pamela works. Just go to scienceontop.com slash live to grab your tickets right now. It's all right. We'll wait. I'm kidding, we won't wait. You can press pause while you go and do it. On today's show, Doggy P Postures, NASA's Parker Solar Probe, and the new mineral never before seen on Earth was found in a meteorite. So let's start with the big news of the week, I think, which was published in the Journal of Zoology. The study finds that smaller dogs lift their legs higher when they pee against lampposts and walls and other objects. Penny, the researchers have theorised that by peeing higher up, they may be trying to fool other dogs into thinking that they're bigger, right? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. That So there's a couple of possible reasons. I have to confess I found a lot of the science stories this week somewhat <laughs> on the depressing side, so I did zero in on the dog pee story. Because that's um, an uplifting one. It's quite literally <laughs> uplifting. <laughs> Um, and, yeah, not not being a dog person myself, I can't say, like, I've studied dog pee in detail, but, you know, I have noticed, you know, they lift their legs and some dogs squat and they like to do it on trees and fire hydrants and all of that kind of thing. And I've known that it is, you know, that their, their urine also contains um, pheromones and stuff and it's a way that dogs communicate with each other. So, um the Betty Maguire is a researcher at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Cornell University who studies and specializes in uh, dog urinary behavior. <laughs> so <laughs> which she's I, the expert in she's dog weed. The one. <laughs> so she's been looking at this for over 10 years, all the different things. So their postures, like which legs they lift, and the other ways that they mark their scent. And what I've really liked is a lot of their work is done in collaboration with dog shelters. So those dogs get a bit of opportunities to exercise and socialise and so on. I thought that was a nice angle. But anyway, back to the dog pee. So (laughs) (laughs) dogs, when they pee on an object, actually seem to aim. And this study Uh, focus on male dogs because they're the ones that usually raise a leg to pee, which gives them a bit more flexibility in terms of where their pee goes. And what they've found is they've looked at mixed breed dogs uh, on walks and they excluded really juvenile dogs who might raise their leg and seniors who might not be able to, accounted for factors like body height, and they videoed the dogs to measure the, the raised leg angle during urination as well as the mark of the urine, so the pee height. And what they found is in some cases, the height that the dog peed reflected the height, the size of the dog. So, you know, big dog pee up high, little dog pee down low. But for little dogs, for small dogs, they actually tried not to fit their pattern. What they seem to do is raise their leg higher to increase the angle 
and got their P hitting a bit higher than you might predict. And props to whoever wrote the article in Scientific American that I was reading, quote, unquote, there is no better use of trigonometry. So, (laughs) and I even saw a little diagram of a dog with the angle of its leg measured and the P height sort of (laughs) illustrated. So that's the P height. So one reason that this might happen, one reason that dogs might do this, and it's not like dogs are sitting down going, "Mm, what is the best possible strategy for my pee? Like they're obviously behaving in an instinctive way. They might be somehow fooling other dogs to think they're a bit bigger than they are, the little dogs, by marking their urine higher. So that might exaggerate their size and maybe help them avoid conflict. It's also been found that little dogs tend to urinate more than larger dogs they mark. So they sort of spread around their scent a bit to perhaps to seem more dominant. Another explanation is that they might do this to try and splash over any previous urine that was there so that uh-huh. their scent message, you know, dogs who do this have their scent message on the top and the higher you are, obviously, the more other urine you're going to cover up. So that's kind of interesting. The other possibility is simply that bigger dogs just might have a higher centre of gravity and not be able to lift their leg to that angle. So they are not, you know, they, they're they just, it's more of a limitation of a bigger dog rather than that the smaller dogs are trying hard. Because I'm sure I've seen like YouTube videos of dogs lifting their legs so high that they actually topple over. Topple over, yeah, apparently. And, that's and you don't want to do that when you're midstream. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's, there's cleanup issues. Yeah. <laughs> I think they've missed something glaringly obvious in this research. If if you've ever had a little dog or been around a little dog, you know that little dogs think they're big dogs. <laughs> they, mm, that's true. They think they're big. So I reckon it's just, just an extension of that psychology. They're walking up to that telegraph pole or that tree and they're going, my God, I have to lift my legs so high because I'm huge and it's huge. I think that's what it is. They're just thinking their undercarriage is huge because they're a huge dog and this is the only way they can possibly clear it. (laughs) Now, I also just wanted to finish off with the the name of the article, Urine Marking in Male Domestic Dogs, Honest or Dishonest? (laughs) That's the paper. Was was it it with a question mark at the end? Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Oh, uh, that's fantastic. Or maybe if Lucas had his way, honest, dishonest, or just delusional. <laughs> delusional. <laughs> I do have to say, though, I mean, you were talking about how they were filming the dogs peeing and everything. Yeah. That's You'd want to have a big white lab coat or something that big is oh. a scientist on when you're going walking the dog and videoing them as they're weak because that's something that's going to get a lot of odd looks, I think. True, but I, I, people... it also makes me wonder whether there were dogs who just got bashful and couldn't go uh, stage fright because <laughs> if someone stares at me in the toilet i'm i find it hard like so why are you looking at me stop looking at me look away look somewhere else yeah yeah couldn't do it fair enough mm. <laughs> also just that's a hell of a job description uh that betty mcguire has where she is the expert in all things dog we from their posture and the sense that they do and even um there was a list of some of the uh, postures that they do, the, the poses that they in when they pee uh, in the Scientific American, which I thought was rather interesting. There's the squat, the squat raise, the arch raise combination, and my favourite, the handstand. Now, I can't I even imagine. can only imagine what that would be. <laughs> what the hell is that? Do they just go, like, raise their back legs up or something? Uh, all right, I'm clicking the link. Um, that, cover me, I'm bizarre. going in. <laughs> But I've also I've also known dogs who, uh, I guess their 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 stance would be called, just don't care. They just wee all over their front paws, <laughs> back Wherever. paws, just doesn't care. The link to the handstand doesn't seem to give much of a description of it, oh. which is both good and bad. I think. <laughs> uh, we'll have to use our imaginations. Uh, well, let's move on, Lucas. After a delayed first attempt. NASA's Parker Solar Probe has been successfully launched on a course for the Sun. This is a really exciting project to get right up close to the surface of the Sun, and I think it's going to be one of the fastest spacecraft we've ever launched as well, which is always cool. Yes, true. Yes, I I believe during its mission, it will become the fastest spacecraft ever so far. 
and then we'll have something else that will get faster because we keep saying this like <laughs> we said the same thing about new horizons so so yeah i'm sure there'll be more fast ones but this one's actually quite a long a quite a long mission because it has basically it's got this really complex um series of venus flybys to sort of gravity assist and, and and set it on its on its pathway so it has seven venus flybys over seven years in order to kind of situate itself to where it needs to be um so i think it's 2022 or 2023 something like that where it actually is is um scheduled to go through the corona the the first time so it's quite a uh, a long mission you know, to, to get it all sorted out. But yeah, we've, so we've, we've, cal- we've mentioned Parker before. And, and of course we've, uh, we've mentioned the, the uh, European Space Agency's version of, of a, of a mission that's, that's doing a similar thing. In fact, we, we even had an interview, which is, will be in our archives with uh, Dr. Lucy Green. So that was really exciting to talk about that. So this particular probe, the Parker Solar probe it's named after dr eugene parker who incidentally is now the first person in history to have had uh, an active soul uh, an active nasa mission named after them who whilst being still alive that was a really awkward way of saying it but basically <laughs> he's alive and that's the first time that's happened so so that's kind of cool He's the first living person to have a mission named after him. So that's kind of cool. And the mission's named after him because he's he's the dude. He's the guy who came up with the what has since become recognised as the solar wind. He's the one who proposed. He said that the, he believes that the, our sun is outgassing. And this is back in the in the 50s. So it was quite bizarre to many at the time. It was it was unconventional. Um, but but. You know, over over the ensuing years, we we've since uh, found that to be the to be the case, and and now you know the solar wind has a a particularly important role to play in in Earth's ionosphere. Uh, it's 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 what's basically uh, involved with. Uh, the the aurora so solar wind and particularly when there's the coronal mass ejections uh they cause this uh these beautiful lights at, at both the, the south and the the north poles and and among other things and of course it's the earth's uh, magnetosphere that uh, uh interacting with the solar wind that causes those things solar wind is also pretty essential for things like light sails so you know the uh launch i think two years ago by the planetary society for uh the first light sail which was a basically a cube sat that had a um, an experimental uh, solar sail deployment and there's another one coming up pretty soon actually where they're going to have cameras on this one this time so you can watch it but anyway that's all off off track but the point is um the solar solar wind is, is is you know is very very interesting to us but what's also interesting and something that's uh that, that we don't really have an answer for is the difference in temperature between the surface of the sun and the chronosphere it's it's very very bizarre because the chronosphere goes up into millions of degrees but the surface of the sun is is a mere few thousand degrees and that's just bizarre we don't really know what the mechanisms are for that there's a couple of competing theories for that and this is exactly one of the things that the parker space probe is tasked with finding out so it's got a suite of instruments on it which are designed to collect um solar particles and to <laughs> in front of the, some of them are quite uh, interestingly named as well to be honest there's a few instruments that uh um nasa have done exactly what we often talk about the astronomy community uh, uh, of doing of, of basically come out with names for instruments that are retrofitted um <laughs> sort of uh Brilliant. acronyms yeah so uh, they they're really good at that so they've got one of the instruments is called fields so fields is a uh, is basically uh, designed to to measure the electric fields around the spacecraft and they've got they've got a series of antennas i think there's five antennas and um these things stick out past the the heat shield on on the parker probe oh actually good point the heat shield itself it's got this really cool heat shield on it because it's going to go through the corona and as i said really hot well not necessarily directly through the you know the main part of the corona but certainly the outer the outer parts of the corona so this this heat shield they've got this four and a half inch thick um, basically 12 centimeters of, of carbon composite uh, material which needs to withstand temperatures apparently up to about oh, about 1400 or, or so degrees celsius so that's that's quite warm <laughs> it, it basically has this big heat shield on the front and then as it flies 
through the corona and through the you know the outer atmosphere the the sun it will orient itself constantly so that it's it's protecting its instruments behind but some of the instruments actually poke out through the shield and around the shield and, and a few other things so so yeah it's kind of cool they've got they've got all these uh little <laughs> like one of them's called a cup it's it's part of this sweep instrument which is the solar wind electrons alphas and protons investigation seriously, seriously, seriously <laughs> anyway that's got a thing in it which is called the solar probe cup which sounds like it belongs in a cricket match for some reason um and the solar probe cup is basically kind of like a, a an electromagnetic field in a in like a cup <laughs> and it's designed to sort of trap these these particles in a, in a vacuum and then then do some analysis on them and it, yeah it's a cup <laughs> that's, like, that's bizarre um there's some other uh things like uh there's there's this thing called esis which is really bizarrely spelt of is and then it's got the symbol for soul our sun which is kind of like a, a sort of an o with a dot in the middle and then is so it's is sun symbol is but it's yeah. pronounced isis they really need again that sun symbol oh, in that because otherwise they just it's had to stick it in there and that stands for integrated science investigation of the sun okay that's <laughs> just really right uh so that's that there's a picture it's... of that it kind of looks like a great big colander um that that's stuck onto the thing and it's got all these little uh little bits sticking out of it so it, it measures electrons and protons and ions and it's designed to you know figure out what the the life cycles are of the the uh the particles in the solar wind and there's a there's a couple of other um instruments on there as well but yeah I, as i say the most interesting thing about this is it will go closer to the sun than anything else will have gone before um significantly closer in fact and uh it's got this really long mission that with these series of uh, flybys from from venus to to get itself situated in the right orbit it's a very elongated orbit very very you know it's like a imagine a comet but much much closer in so it goes way out wide out to venus and then then sort of skims through the the, the sun's atmosphere and then back out wide again and so forth in a, in a series of orbits so pretty cool and yeah it's 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 it exists now because it's actually launched <laughs> so i'm happy to talk about it because it's not something that's going to disappoint me <laughs> very good uh we're talking about the the heat that it's and the heat shield and everything mm. uh obviously you've still got all these instruments that need power so they're all solar powered but that is also a challenge because solar cells don't like high temperatures but they need to be in the sunlight and everything so there's kind of this tricky little shadow system that they use they're water cooling the panels and things like that so it's a lot of intricate technology to keep them cool yeah and then apparently even though these these huge temperatures the inside of the of the probe itself only gets about 80 something degrees oh it's 80 something degrees fahrenheit whatever yeah that so is, about 30 degrees celsius which is just yeah. amazing i mean that that's, that's a seriously cool, cool heat shield that they've that's got cooler than my computer often runs <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. a lot of computers get up sort of around almost on 100 degrees celsius so uh depending on what you're doing so yeah that's that's really cool and literally um, cool <laughs> we're talking about uh measuring the solar wind and why it's important to learn about that 538 blog had a in-depth report on the the parker probe and they told something that I hadn't realized was an issue. Obviously, we've talked about the danger to satellite communications and things. And there was the, the Carrington event, I think, in right. what was that? Yep. 18, we 19 or something. Lucy Green as Lucy well. Lucy Green, yep. yeah. But in 2017, when Hurricane Irma was charging through the Caribbean, and we talked about that last week with regards to the lizards evolving, uh, but with all the destruction from the hurricane, the satellite communications were knocked out by x-rays and all this high energy material coming from the sun and that really had an impact on emergency services and their ability to communicate and to find people and get uh aid to where it was needed so really i did not know that yeah it's kind of like a big screw you from nature it's like, uh, <laughs> pretty much mother earth called up uh, the sun and said hey i'm gonna throw down a hurricane <laughs> to mess with their comms that'd be awesome yeah the uh, proverbial perfect storm as it were yes um so, yeah, it's an important stuff, important work. But, uh, and also, like I said, the fastest uh, craft that we've got at the moment and it'll get to top speeds of 190 kilometres a second. That's 
pretty impressive. Lazy. Lazy. Just lazy. <laughs> Oh, I'd like to um, see you do better. <laughs> true. No, that, I can't personally do better. Um, we, we're not, not going to get a whole lot of really cool pictures for this one. There, there is an imaging instrument on it, but uh, um, basically it's used for um, taking wide view images of the uh, of the chronosphere and trying to figure out what it, how it's going to approach and so forth. So, so it won't be like a Cassini sort of thing with a with a whole lot of really beautiful imagery for years and years. Okay. Penny, Russian geologists have announced at the annual meeting of the Meteoritical Society in Moscow their findings into an odd mineral found in a Russian meteorite. And I've seen some media reports state that this mineral, which has never before been found on Earth, is harder and stronger than diamonds. But that's not quite true, is it? Not quite true. Two reasons. One is we don't actually have enough of it to see how strong it is. But the other one is that the closest mineral to it is probably only a nine on most hardness scale, or, you know, between nine and ten. And diamond is ten, and apparently between nine and ten is quite a, a spread. But it's so I feel like there's often these kind of somewhat misleading mineral from space. You know, oh, it's a planet made of diamonds, and um, you know, I know everyone pictured you know basically like a cut diamond from a piece of jewelry, but it's not quite. That kind of thing. But anyway, this mineral is interesting in its own right. It came from the, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Uakit meteorite, which is named for a location where it was found. And so they've called the mineral Uakitite. So the bits that have been found within the meteorite, um, more than 98% of it is a different mineral called um, camasite, which is an alloy of iron and nickel. The remaining bits are really unique space minerals, um, a dozen different minerals. So all of these rocks only form in space, so we haven't found them forming naturally on Earth. But the bits of uacotite are only five micrometres big. So they can only be seen with a microscope that's about 25 times smaller than a grain of sand. So we're talking about tiny, tiny, tiny little bits It's a kind of mineral called a mononitride. It has a single nitrogen atom, and these are apparently very, very hard minerals that are often used as abrasives. Because the grains were so small, it couldn't be measured directly, so anything saying it's harder than a diamond, it's not quite fair. Um, They made vanadium nitride, which is a mineral that closely resembles uacotite, and that has a, and that leads them to a predicted sort of hardness between 9 and 10. On the one hand, I guess another weird mineral that formed in space at temperatures of, you know, over a 1,000 degrees, wow, but (laughs) there's so little of it. I don't know if it would be something that would ever be... um, Mineable or Yeah, usable usable or or replicatable or anything. But I've always liked meteorites. Um, My wedding ring has a bit of meteorite in it, which I think is pretty special. For real? Yeah, yeah, for real. Unfortunately, cool. I don't always wear that particular ring, though, because unfortunately, even though it's cool, it's also not a particularly hard and rust-resistant um, substance. Right. So I, I tend to bring it out for special occasions. Yeah, perhaps your archetype would be better for the jewellery business, <laughs> the niche, the relatively niche jewellery. Yeah, oh, very cool. And I, I always think it's interesting when... We find something like that. And you get these headlines. Like I said, I mean, Forbes headline was alien mineral discovered inside Russian media. Yeah, I know. Immediately think of the X-Files. Yeah, exactly. It's going to make eyes turn black and weird stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just this guy smoking a cigarette and looking dark in the background like he planned it all. Um, but, you know, it's it's such a small sample size. It's cool you know, and it could be impressive. Props to whoever was like, let's try and make this story appeal to a somewhat broader <laughs> audience than it might have otherwise appealed to. You know? True. Like, True. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it got us reading yeah, it exactly. and talking about it. <laughs> no, it's very good. Uh, we should also point out, like I said, it was uh, revealed at a... A meeting. It was a, a talk given there. It wasn't anything published in a peer-reviewed paper or anything. So, still sketchy on some of the details, but still interesting and always good to 
learn more stuff. And on that note, uh, that's our show. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web, scienceontop.com slash 307. Don't forget, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate to support us on Patreon. And just another reminder, get your tickets to see Dr. Pamela Gay live in Melbourne on Wednesday, October 10th by going to scienceontop.com slash live. And of course, a big thanks to you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. But importantly, for a consolidated energy market like ours, providing uh, incentives for new entrants to give that competitive tension. And I'm not afraid to say the C word. Coal, coal, coal uh, is going to be one of those areas that we're going to invest in because that is what our own energy... Uh, market experts say that 2030 uh, coal is still going to make up 60% of our energy mix. So it's not going anywhere in the short term. And what we need to see is greater competition in the energy market.